Welcome to our episode of Revenue Chat. Today we have Ruth King, best-selling author who says, Volume is vanity, profits are sanity. Her big dream is that every small business is profitable and understands true profitability. Her latest bestseller on Amazon is The Courage to be Profitable. A seasoned serial entrepreneur who helps businesses get and stay profitable since 1981, she grows her own businesses as well as coaches, speaks, and helps other small business owners reach their goals. We get business tips from Ruth next on Revenue Chat. Hi, everyone. This is Tony Gerso with Revenue Chat, brought to you by Easy Sales Procedures. With us, we have Ruth King, best-selling author who helps businesses get and stay profitable. A serial entrepreneur, she owns seven businesses in the past 30 years. One of her businesses helps small business owners truly understand and profit from their financial statements. After 12 years on the road, she found a better way to reach entrepreneurs who want to build their businesses, she began internet training in 1998 and began her first television broadcasting in 2002. Her latest channel, ProfitabilityRevolution.com, broadcasts ideas, news, strategies, and other information that matters to small business owners 24-7. Ruth also started the Decatur, Georgia branch of the Small Business Development Center. She founded the Women's Entrepreneurial Center and taught a year-long course for women who want to start their own business. She holds an MBA in finance from Georgia State University. Ruth's best-selling book, The Courage to be Profitable, is preceded by two award-winning books, The Ugly Truth About Small Business and The Ugly Truth About Managing People. All right, get ready for Ruth to give us help on becoming more profitable. Hello, Ruth. How are you? I'm great, Tony. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Oh, my great pleasure here. It's an honor to have you, and I thank you so much. Ruth, you're a very accomplished woman, so I must ask you, how did it all start? Well, I actually started businesses when I was a kid. I knew I was always going to have a small business. My dad was an entrepreneur. My grandfather was an entrepreneur, so I guess you can say it's in our blood. Um, but, you know, cool. I was selling things when I was a kid. And I went to school and, you know, got my MBA in in finance. And, you know, I, it was preceded, believe it or not, by two degrees in chemical engineering. And everybody wow. was going, you know, I just didn't like being a chemical engineer. I just didn't like it. And I was searching around for something else to do and started a small business development center, loved working with small business owners. And the rest is history. It's been a blast. That is so cool. So, Tell me, let's talk about the small business owners that you help. When do they really begin to understand the financial side of their business? <laughs> Only when they get in trouble. You know, it would be really good <laughs> if we could give everybody a pill so they never get into trouble on the financial side of their business. But, but you know, Tony, I mean, let's be real. You know, none of us, unless you're a bookkeeper or CPA, including me, started a business to do the books and understand financial statements. But, you know, as we grow, those are the things that will keep us in business or put us out of business if we don't pay attention to them. And it's it's really what normally happens is somebody can't make payroll or they lose a major customer to a competitor or a vendor calls them on the phone and says, uh, if I don't get a check by Friday, I'm going to, you know, cancel your account or a um, you know receivable that's supposed to be net 30 turns into net 90, and they have cash flow issues. I mean, there's that's generally when somebody starts paying attention. Unfortunately, you know, I, I would love to you know sit everybody down in school and say, look, accounting's not hard. You just got to spend 30 minutes a month doing it, and 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 do it, and just you know make the commitment to yourself that you are going to do it and have fun with it. Believe it or not. Wow. That sounds interesting. Now, I know you. your latest book is The Courage to be Profitable, which is doing great. But on this particular subject, we're talking about the small business owners. Is that what you're saying about the accounting and confronting finances? Is that what you kind of mean on that other award-winning book, The Ugly Truth About Small Business? Is that what that subject is about? Well, The Ugly Truth About Small Business was actually written because I lost – 
a $1.6 million contract, 800000 of investment riding on that, and a partner the same day, and still started up my sixth business. And oh, my I, goodness. And I knew that if I had gone through that horrific experience and survived, and that was 2003, by the way. So, I mean, it's still going today, and it's 2015, which is kind of cool. But anyway, um, if I had gone through those horrific experiences, other people have gone through some really tough times and, and lived to tell about it. And so I, I wrote the book to basically allow people to learn from our mistakes and not make them. Um, the, the really smart business owners read books like this or listen to your podcasts and don't do the stupid things that we did and, and save themselves a lot of money and a lot of heartache. And that's what that book is about. Fifty business owners have shared willingly their the things that they screwed up on and, and the things that they are trying to get other small business owners not to do so that they don't make those mistakes. Okay, I got that. Now I have to ask you, I might stump you here, but but Ruth, why is it the ugly truth? Why is truth ugly? <laughs> well, it's it's the ugly truth is that most people don't face it. You know, the ugly truth about um, small business is that small businesses will kill you if you don't watch out and do some specific things. Makes good sense. All right, we talked about that book. Before I go into the the current affairs, let's just talk about. What's the difference between that and the other award-winning book, The Ugly Truth About Managing People? The Ugly Truth About Small Business talks about all business subjects. It talks about things that happen with sales, things that happen with you know, accounts, things that happen with partners. I mean, every facet of business. The Ugly Truth About Managing People only deals with the people side of business. And it deals with them, and I have stories in there from people who – you know, hired their first employee to all the way up to somebody who was a Fortune 50 company having to go into a situation. And, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it to the book. But basically, lessons learned that small business owners can not do when they're hiring and managing and dealing with people. Firing, too. Okay, makes sense. Thanks for clearing that up because it made me wonder. All right, mm-hmm. let's kind of get back into the business. So, you know, I've taken a number of classes on business. I have a degree in business. and But there is this confusion. So what is really the most important? Is it cash? Is it cash flow? Or is it profits? Okay. Let's, can, can we imagine that we have a tank of water? And mm-hmm. this is a long answer, but I want to explain it so that everybody gets it visually. All right. So let's assume we have a tank of water, and on the top of the tank is a spigot that lets more water in, and the bottom of the tank there's a drain that lets water out, or you know, it drains water out. And instead of that water, that level of water in the tank, let's assume that it's cash. Okay. It's the amount of cash that's in your checking accounts and in your petty cash and your savings accounts and whatever. But it is a certain level of cash. And if cash, okay. you know, cash. Cash, basically, you know, we write checks to pay our bills, keep the, the roof over our heads and our, pay our rent and the utility bills, et cetera. But if all we were concerned about was cash, every month we would open the drain and pay our bills and the level of, of cash in the tank would be less. At some point in time, we would open the drain and there would be no more cash left. So cash, while you absolutely have to have it to pay your bills, is not as important as cash flow, which is – when you you have a certain level of cash in in the tank at the beginning of the month, you open the spigot and you add to it from collections on sales. It's not the sale itself. It's actually getting the money for that sale. Um, you might sell an asset. You might um, borrow you know from a line of credit or a bank or something like that. And you might get a little bit of interest, and I mean a little bit of interest on our savings accounts these days. And those are the major ways that cash comes into the company. And you know, throughout the month, you're going to put cash in, and the level of cash in your tank is going to rise. And then at some point in the month, that's it. That's all that's coming in. And you're still going to open the drain in the bottom, and you're going to pay all of your bills, and you're gonna, the level of cash in the tank is going to go down, and then it will stop. And then you're going to add to it on top, take it out on the bottom you know it's just a simple cash flow which is important and i the profit piece of it is the most important and here's why i had a client um who has now since retired he started his business with zero and grew to about two million dollars in 12 years and he do it he did it totally on cash 
and the cash from one project started the next. The cash from that, you know, finishing that project started the next project. And as long as he was growing, he always had cash. He could pay his bills. He did, could take mm-hmm. his vendor discounts. He could do payroll. You know, life was really good. He hit about $2 million, and the growth stopped. And all of a sudden, well, not all of a sudden, within a couple of months, he started noticing that it, sometimes it was tough to get payroll, and he couldn't always take his vendor discounts. And he goes, wait a minute, I'm this $2 million company. I've never had this problem. You know, something's wrong here. And he was smart enough to raise his hand and say, I need help. So went in there, and to make a long story short, he was losing a nickel for every dollar that came in the door for 12 years. My, 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 a nickel. The thing, yeah, and the thing, it was, it was so small that, you know, the cash flow was coming in and, and going out, but the fact that he was growing meant that the cash flow was going up faster than it was going out until he stopped growing. Then he was losing cash in the tank by 5% every single month. And he raised his prices about 10%, a little bit more, on I think. And his comment to me was, where were you 20 years ago? <laughs> you know, <exactly>. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but, um, yeah, but growth masks so much with respect to it. So positive leads to positive cash flow, which leads to cash. Wow. That's amazing. I like that. Okay, so for a business, what financial information do they need so that they can catch that they're losing that 5%? All right. You know, let me. Can I answer that and with a question before oh, I answer absolutely. that? Yeah. All right. Most people are are just get their profit and loss statement and balance sheet and look at the profit and loss statement and I made a profit or I had a loss. I throw it in a drawer and never look at it again. All right. That's the typical business owner until something like this happens. And reality says is you need a profit and loss statement and the balance sheet every single month. And I don't think that you should actually produce those financial statements. Now, why do you say that? Because we're not bookkeepers. We're just not bookkeepers. Um, we we delegate the day-to-day responsibility for doing the debits and credits, putting in the payroll, putting in the receivables, doing the billing, collecting the you know the checks and all that stuff. And then they produce financial statements for us, and we look at the financial statement as owners. We can never, ever abdicate the responsibility overall for the financial health of our company. But we can delegate day-to-day work, and I suggest we do, and not to our wives. Earlier in this conversation, you talked about doing it for 30 minutes, you know, a month, uh, a month but now you're, can you correlate that with this and how, sure. how you, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Basically, when you are reviewing your financial statements every single month that your bookkeeper has prepared, it's going to take you less than 30 minutes a month to do it once you get the habit. It takes a little bit of time on the front end. But the bookkeeping, which is not done by you as the owner, um, takes a whole lot longer than 30 minutes because you know, you've know you got to pay the bills and collect the money and do the general ledger and all the other fun things that go along with that. And, and, and most companies, as they grow, you have a full-time bookkeeper who that is his or her responsibility. But your responsibility as a business owner is oversight. It is looking at what the bookkeeper has produced and then – doing the analysis, and making good business decisions based on accurate financial data. So okay. that's that's the difference. Okay. Now, in running a business, Ruth, should it be done on a cash-based or accrual-based, and why? All right. It should be done on an accrual base. And the, the, the tricky part comes in is if you just rely on your CPA because a lot of taxes are done on a cash basis. All right. Here's mm-hmm. the difference. Um, cash basis accounting is done when you receive your money for your sale. It's a sale, not when you bill a customer. So the only time you have a sale is when you get the money for the sale. The only time you have an expense is when you write the check for the expense. There's no accounts receivable. There's no accounts payable. And there is no inventory. And most of us have one or more of those things. I mean, even a restaurant where you pay COD, they probably have some people they pay in 30 days. So they have some payables. Um, So on a cash basis accounting, you're actually fooling yourself. And in The Courage to Profitable, I talk about a story of a woman who knew something was wrong. And it was that she was on a cash basis and found out that 
she was actually not profitable. And, and here's why. Um, on an accrual basis, you have a sale when you send out the invoice for that sale, whether or not you get the money for it. You have an expense when you get the bill from the vendor, whether or not you are paying that expense right away. So you have revenues and expenses. Whether or not you've paid for them is the ability to match revenues and expenses and make sure that you are profitable. So let me see whether I can explain this a different way. Um, let's assume you're on a cash basis and you're really, really busy and you show a loss. And you're going, this is crazy. I mean, I'm really busy. I'm sh- I'm sh- my P&L is showing that I have a loss. What's going on here? Well, what's happening is you're so busy. You have billed, which you should have billed, but you haven't gotten your money yet. And you still got to pay all your bills. So, mm-hmm. you know, you've got little revenue and a lot of expense. And so it, in a very busy time of year, you can show a loss. And on the flip side, when you're slower, all the money's coming in from all the work that you did, and you still don't have that many bills, so you're, you're slow and you show this incredible profit, and you go, wait a minute, what's going on here? This doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Whereas if you are on an accrual basis, that counts as a sale whether or not you got the money for it, and it counts as an expense whether or not you've paid that bill. So it, it really lets you see what your revenues and what your expenses are. Makes sense. Now, does that apply for any size business, including those yep. starting up? Because you yep. you would think, maybe incorrectly, you would think that especially for really small businesses starting, that a cash based system might make more sense. No, nope. but no, no, no. But I but I doubt that. Okay, <laughs> all right. Okay. Now, the confusion so, yes. comes is that the IRS lets you pay your taxes up to a certain million dollar size. And I can't remember what it is. It's either, I mean, I don't do tax law. I I, I let the CPAs do taxes. But anyway, there is up to a certain size that they allow you to file your taxes on a cash basis, even if you operate your business on an accrual basis. So the accountant makes all all of the journal entries to put you back to a cash basis. And you think, oh, that's the way I should be. No. Run your business on an accrual basis, and if you and your CPA decide that you want to have cash basis for your taxes, go for it. Interesting. Okay. Let's take a look more into the business in terms of you once said here that a business should run by net profit on an hourly basis. Can you expound on that, please? Okay. Net profit per hour is saying that for all for every hour that is revenue generating – how much profit do you make? Okay. So, for example, let's assume that you are a service company of some way, shape, or form. You provide marketing services, for example, and you are in a situation where you're doing a project for a company, for a customer, and that project, let's say, is going to bill um, $1,000. Okay. And you know that the you had 10 hours on that project that somebody built, all right? So your your gross profit, I can't explain it that way. The, the best way to explain it is if there's $1,000 for a project and there were 10 hours on it and you, you netted, i.e. net profit for that job was $1,000 and there were 10 hours, your net profit per hour is going to be $100 per hour, okay? What it, what, it, what it does is it forces you to look not only at the top line and your gross profit line, but and but you have to take into consideration overhead and to really see what your bottom line is. And it's really interesting to do this with companies because first time they look at it and they think, oh, we were really, really profitable last year. I had one business owner who netted $50,000 last year and was thrilled with it. And we calculated how many hours it actually took to do those that fifty thousand dollar profit, and he ended up earning nine dollars and forty eight cents an hour. I mean, I remember this like it was yesterday. And he looked oh at my. me and went, "I can make that much at McDonald's." And I got, "Yeah, you can." Oh my! <laughs> oh my! With so, a lot less stress and a lot <laughs> less headaches. Yep, absolutely. Wow, so that's it's, interesting. Yeah, and then the car should be profitable is the whole formula on how to actually do it. And it, it just 
for your own edification, do it. You know, it was interesting because I was speaking to a group who shall remain nameless, and I was going through how to calculate net profit per hour and what it meant and things like that. And nobody in that room wanted to look at their financial statements and see what their net profit per hour was. I knew how well they were doing just by that. They weren't doing well. Wow. Yeah. That's an interesting thing to look. It makes me afraid to look at it too, but – it's it seems on, Tony, to be the right it. way to go. It's where it's where it's got to go. Yeah. Now you um, me- you mentioned. Oh, sorry. I was going to say percentages don't matter. You can't take a percentage uh-huh. to the bank. The only thing you can take to the bank is a dollar sign. That's right. That's the only thing they accept. Yeah. Now you touched upon this earlier, but I wanted to make sure that we've really taken a good look at it because you said something about the balance sheet being more important than the P and L. But aren't we taught that the P&L is the kingpin in all this? Unfortunately, yes. However, that's because balance sheets most people don't get. And they're really very, very easy. And what a, ba- a balance sheet tells you whether you're truly profitable or not. Your P&L just tells you you're profitable for a period of time. I mean, Tony, I'll bet you've had times where you've had really lousy years or really lousy months and you're going – thank goodness that month is over, or thank goodness that year is over and we get to start over, right? Yeah. Yeah, so that's what the P&L does. You start over. You just you had a great month, too bad. You still got to start over. You had a lousy month, thank goodness that month is over and we get to start over. Um, true, and they're only, only for a specific period of time. Your balance sheet is a history, and it started when the day you started your business, and it will go until the day you sell your business or it closes its doors. And it will show you whether you're, you're you're truly profitable or not. And the way I define profitability is con, is sustained profits. So you could be profitable one month and have three months of losses, and another month of profitability and four months of losses. That's not true profitability. You're going the wrong way. So basically, okay. that that's one thing. Balance sheet also tells you whether you can pay your bills. It tells you whether you're taking on too much inventory. If you've got inventory, it tells you. Um, whether you're taking on too much debt, you know, lots of things that are actually come off the balance sheet that people don't pay attention to, and they absolutely should. Yeah. Now, balance sheets can be confusing, and there can be uh, errors and mistakes. What are some of the common mistakes people make on their balance sheet? My favorite one, negative cash. Uh. (laughs) Ah. Tony, has your banker ever allowed you to have a negative balance in your checking account? They charge me money if that happens. <laughs> <laughs> There's no such thing as a negative anything. That's, it just yeah, doesn't you exist. Yeah, you can't have negative cash in your in your checking account, but yet I see negative cash on balance sheets all the time. And and this is what generally happens. When you have QuickBooks or you have Peachtree, which is now Sage, um, the the accounting program doesn't care that you have negative numbers. It just cares that debits match credits. That's it. It's got a balance. Mm-hmm. So what mm-hmm. some bookkeepers do is they say, okay, here's all the bills that I have to pay for the month, and they print out all the checks, and they keep the checks on their desk. And then as the money comes in and they deposit it in the bank, they send out those checks. Well, mm-hmm. if the end of the month comes and there's still checks, then you've got a negative balance in your cash account because the bookkeeping or the QuickBooks thinks that you've actually, you know, written those checks and they've gone away and everything like that and you don't owe that money anymore. But you don't. You can't write a check unless you've got the money in the bank to pay for it. And then you won't have negative cash. Interesting. Yep. Very interesting. Okay. Well, yeah. now what's uh You talked about you have a way of having people stay honest, especially when they're dealing with the accounting and so forth. I happen to know someone who's in the family. The uh, one of the people is extremely wealthy for a long, long period of time. And one day this person came to work and there was no money in the bank and the accountant had literally here really happened. The accountant left and went to another country and took, was taking cash out, putting it in another account. And one day the accountant left and everything was gone. Now the accountant, that accountant was probably honest at one point, but when he saw all this huge money flowing in and that the owner 
wasn't like knee deep Paying and attention. Micro, yeah. micromanaging, he found that he could just pilfer it little by little until he stole it all. So mm-hmm. what's a good way to keep these honest people honest so that they don't steal from you? All right. The mistake that the, that wealthy guy did was he allowed his bookkeeper to have check signing privileges on his accounts. Yes. Yeah. No. No bookkeeper has check signing privileges. None. Zero. Nada. I agree with that. Yeah. Hind- that's, with hindsight, yeah. Yeah. And then the other thing you want to do is send your bank statements home. Those are the two major things that absolutely have to happen. And if you get your bank statements sent home, so as soon as – if you're listening to this – this radio program, and you do not have your bank statements home, immediately when you get off this listening to this radio program, call your banker or next morning or whenever you're watching it, listening to this, if it's you know not banking hours, send your bank statements home. It will keep the honest people honest. You go through the bank statements or the microfiches these days, and then you actually bring the statement in for the bookkeeper to balance. You know, and it, and it's really interesting because number one, the bookkeeper knows they can't write a check and get fudged or something along those lines because you'll recognize the signature as being right or wrong and knowing you either wrote a check or didn't write a check. And I, I one of I was teaching a class one time and one of the business owners in class went to it and, and he had his bank statement sent to his home and then he um, sent me an email a little bit later, and he said, you're not going to believe this. I said, yeah, I am. <laughs> I've been through it. He said, I went through my checks, and a check that was supposed to be written for $47 was written for $547. And so he brought it into the bookkeeper the next morning. Sure enough, the, the invoice shows it's $47, and the back stub shows it's $47. The vendor had added the $500 to it. Oh, my, my. It wasn't even an employee of his company who did it. It was another guy's company's vendor. So the bank went after the vendor because he had proof that it should have been $47, not $547. So it's not necessarily only your employees. It could be your vendor's employees. Well, crazy. okay, that is something. When the business gets too big, you have to have someone in-house write, write your checks. So you now have an employee that writes the checks and pays the checks and everything, but but the business owner should spend some time, what each month, and go through the books himself and make sure that everything makes sense and and, and look for any flags. Well, the business owner should sign the checks. All right. I mean, even Oprah signs her own checks. Come on. How how okay. how how big is she? I mean, she's huge. And look at the checks. Look at what you're signing, and make sure it makes sense. And if it doesn't make sense pull the purchase order or pull whatever you know documentation is behind the check and go investigate it. You you should be signing every single check. Now, you're going to say you're going to say Ruth, what happens if I go on vacation or something along those lines? You can prepay bills, you can prepay payroll. Um there can be a check or two left, you know, with instructions from the bank that it's not supposed to be over X number of dollars for this period of time. There's lots of ways to to basically go away, so to speak. Um, and the other thing is you have never, ever, 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 ever have a signature stamp. Good points. Good points. Now you teach all this in your business profitability revolution. Yes. And a whole lot more. I mean, I'm, I only do the financial piece of this, but, um, profitability revolution is making sure that all business owners get and stay profitable. I mean, and I have a, a host who does sales. I have a host who does marketing, host who does women's business, hope who does HR. We have personal development. We have all sorts of things for every every business. You know, if you're waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning with a problem, we probably have the answer to it. Um, and it's not only, you know, profitability is not only financial profitability. It is making sure your, sure your sales are profitable, making sure your people are productive, you know, the HR, we have a show called HR Heaven or Hell, which is done by Susie Lemon, and she's great. Uh, she's been in, in business. She has her own business. Everybody who's a host has their own business, so they understand small business, number one. And she's been dealing with HR issues for more than 20 years, and the stories are phenomenal. <laughs> cool. I'm looking at the website now, ProfitabilityRevolution.com. This is a live video, 24-7 video broadcast, TV broadcast. If you can think Golf Channel, Food Channel, we're the small business channel, except we're on the Internet, and you can watch it on a mobile device. You can watch it through our app. You can watch it anyway. You know, you don't have to be chained to a desk 
to watch us. Nice. Very nice. Very nice. How, and this and this has been running since uh, 2002? No, this one's been running for about two years now. Um, HVAC Channel TV, which is another website, has been running since 2002. That's very nice. Let's talk about your book now, The Courage to Be Profitable, and how this all relates with that book. Because, again, you talk about it's the courage to be profitable. So, yeah, let's talk about that. Okay. If you are, if you have the courage, you will raise your hand and say, I need some help. If you are, if you know you're in trouble and you don't do anything about it, you don't have the courage to be profitable. I mean, I start the book off with two guys. One of them, uh, I think it's Steve and George, and, and George took over his business. And these are all true stories. They're all my clients, believe it or not. Um, George took over the family business. He'd been operational manager for years, and he bought the business from his dad and his uncle. And all of a sudden, I mean, he never had to pay attention to the financial side of the business. His dad and his uncle did it. And so he'd start getting calls from vendors saying, if I didn't have a check, he had problems from payroll every once in a while. And so he said, I need some help. And he, we, I came in and we figured out what was wrong and, and fixed it, and he's done phenomenally well. He had the courage to raise his hand and say, help. Steve, on the other hand, um, bought his, took over his dad's business when it was about 700000 grew it to $15 million, and watched his business die. It went from oh $15 million to $10 million. I mean... And, and finally sold it around six million dollars, and it's miserable. And he, the sorry part about it, or the sad part about it, is that he, before he took his dad's business over, he was a credit manager. He understood P and L's and balance sheets, but he watched his business die. That's not the courage to be profitable. I see. Rather than making the and, tough decisions, and, he let it die. Well, we've all seen companies that do that. I'm the the cover of your book, it says get and stay profitable in less than 30 minutes a month. Yep. Remember That's, the bookkeeper does the book. Yep. I you gonna, do the I analysis. Gonna, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it takes guts to stay ahead in business. Yeah. And make the tough that. decisions. Make That's the tough very decisions. Interesting. Mm-hmm. But Ruth, this analysis you, will help you do it. Sorry. I got it. So you currently advise businesses and you will, you will take – your business is to take on businesses that need help or assistance or want to grow. Tell us about that. I do a little bit of consulting. Um, my my major focus right now is growing profitability revolution. I mean, I'm only one person, so there's only a limited number of people I personally can help. But with the profitability revolution and that whole TV series and the TV show and the TV network, we can help millions of people get and stay profitable. And that's the goal is for every business to be profitable. Can you imagine if every single business were profitable, what would happen? We all have a lot more fun. Yes, <laughs> definitely. And we'd have we'd have so much difference in, in the businesses and everything like that. It would be really, really, really cool. Does your company do one-on-one or is it training classes? How do you help the business? Like what methods do you utilize? All all the above. We do classes. I do a lot of internet-based classes. I have one called Make Your Financial Statements Fun and Sexy, which is um, an interesting class that will open your eyes. And you do that online. And we review your homework, which is all on your financial statements. And we have other classes that we do that are online. And you know, I'm in Atlanta, and I jokingly say, wherever Delta flies, I will go. <laughs> but you know, and I've been places Delta doesn't fly. And so, you know, I've I've done a lot of work throughout this country. The only state I haven't been in is North Dakota. And I'm jokingly saying somebody's going to send me to Fargo, and I just hope it's not in January or February. <laughs> exactly. That's funny. Ruth, what's your ideal client or is there any size client that you look for or like what makes a client proper, you know, versus could they be too small or too big for your company? Uh, From the standpoint of profitability revolution, number one, you can watch all the programs free. So that's appropriate for anybody. If if you want the – library with about 350 programs that on all aspects of business that is membership of $197 a year so that's I mean it's a no-brainer basically to be able to do that Um, we have a 
platinum membership, which is 397 a month, which is like mastermind groups. So we do a lot of work that way also in bringing together non-competing small business owners and, and being mean, cruel, and rotten and making them do their financial statements and their ratios and, and grow their businesses that way. So we have that group too. Um, I do one-on-one coaching, consulting for larger companies who are generally over a million dollars in size um, because that's when they really can afford me. You know, as on an individual basis, and then I do a lot of training. I do a lot of speaking all over the, you know, all over the country. And you know, haven't been abroad yet in terms of speaking, but I'd love to do it. Oh my God, on your website, can you be contacted here? Yep. Okay. It's, good. 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 Yeah. So, if someone wants to to find out more about this, they can go to the site. They can contact you here. They can ask some questions. They can find mm-hmm. out. What would be the right thing for them? Good. Well, sure. The site looks good. Very cool. What else can we tell our people about making more profit? Any other tips or practices you'd like to mention? Uh, the, the one is not to be afraid of your financial statements. All right. Um, accounting was developed around 1300 by the Venetian monks who had to take care of the rich Italians' money, and they had to find a way to systematize it. So they came up with the accounting system that we're still using today, the format for a profit and loss statement and a balance sheet. They didn't have QuickBooks. They didn't have a calculator. So they had to make it easy. I think that uh, CPAs and, and bookkeepers have made this mystery cloud of what accounting and bookkeeping is all about and we as business owners are afraid to look at our P&Ls and our balance sheets because number one we haven't taken the time to learn about it which is really easy you've done harder things I promise you you have um, <laughs> spend you know, spend the half hour read the book it'll explain it all in English you know that type of thing but just don't be afraid do not be afraid of the financial side because it will bite you in the butt one day I think we're afraid, Ruth, because we're afraid to discover that all the hard work we've put into the business and we get so little out of it. And that, yes, McDonald's would be uh, a close second. Well, then it's time to get real and, and, be, <laughs> and have the courage to be profitable. <laughs> very true. Very well said. I think that's where it is. What The businesses that I see and the, the companies that I run into, I run into that. Very interesting. Anything else for our guests? This is very good. It's very informative. Well, don't be afraid. All I can say is don't be afraid. Just do it. Use a Nike well, term very, and just do it. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, Ruth, I wanted to thank you very much for coming on our show. It's been an honor and a pleasure to have you and, and have you talk to our audience. I, I hope that uh, everyone's taken away some good information on this. Uh, it's definitely opened my eyes up some. Well, good. I'm glad. Well, excellent. Well, good, good, good. Well, then, very good. Well, thanks once again, and uh, very much enjoyed it. Um, Thank everyone for attending. We'd like you to stay tuned to our next show on Revenue Chat. We're going to have Mayor DeHaan, CEO of Prime 5 Homes, who says, money should be invested in a cause rather than the person who made it. Despite the housing market travails in the late 2000s, Mayor was still able to build and sell more homes than ever before. He considers himself a creative nonconformist and home development revolutionist. Mayor shares his philosophy and successful insights with us on the next episode of Revenue Chat. This is Tony Gierso brought to you by Easy Sales Procedures. Get the book at TonyDurso.com. Until next time, and remember, you can make life better for yourself and everyone. Choose wisely.
Hi, this is Tony D'Urso, author of the new book, Easy Sales Procedures. You know, in my career, I've made impressive record-breaking sales forays into real estate, collectibles, insurance technology, and other varied industries. My accomplishments include raising $3.25 million in a six-month period. Now, despite what we've been told, sales is an art. There are sales procedures that can be applied precisely as a science, but in essence, it's truly an art. There are fundamentals that you need in place that will help you with your sales, marketing, and business. Get easy sales procedures to help put your business into proper perspective. You know, too many people seem to make sales complicated. Hey, it's easy. All you need are some basics. In three words, open, agree, and get. That's it. That's easysalesprocedures.com. This book will endow you with the simple truths at the core of being a sales master and also contains salesman training drills that when practiced, demonstrate how to interest any person in anything. These simple procedures can be applied by anyone from any walk of life because in modern day society, every person is involved in interesting or selling someone something. That's easy sales procedures. Get your copies now at a low price from EasySalesProcedures.com. Order enough for all your employees, too. Here's to volume sales success for your life and business.